Hey guys, Sean here at the Gardener Center. So we've been doing these videos um, every week for well over a year now. We take a little break during the holidays, but we've been really pushing them out every single week for well over a year now. And because I'm the guy that gets to talk about outdoor gardening, I have a whole bunch of topics that fall under that umbrella. So I, I've talked to you guys about all sorts of stuff over the past year. The one subject I have completely avoided has been lawns and lawn care specifically um couple of reasons for that and i mean guys we're all friends here so i don't feel obligated to sugarcoat anything in the world of gardening number one lawns are boring and number two lawns and every single thing we have to do to maintain them as such are absolutely terrible for the environment so I haven't spent a lot of time talking about them, but you know, I really wanted to kind of address the elephant in the room. And I thought a good way to do that would be really to kind of educate you guys a bit about why we have lawns, um, why they're not good ecologically for the world we live in, and then to really get into some specifics of the different products people commonly use on them just so you guys are a little more educated so you could make um make better decisions on what you do and how you care for your lawn and how you can kind of um kind of reduce that negative impact that they have on this world that we live in so even if you only spend five minutes a year thinking about your lawn you may want to stick around and listen because i think i'm going to go over some really cool stuff today so stick around all right guys so anybody who knows me better than just a little knows that not only am I a plant nut, but I'm also a bit of a history nut, to say the least. Um, so anytime I get to talk about horticulture and history and I get to do that kind of mashup, it's really good times ahead for Sean. I love talking, I love talking about horticulture as it relates to history. Um, so a little bit on, a little bit of the backstory on the lawn and unfortunately, we're kind of constrained by time with our videos here, but you know, once we're all comfortable getting back together again and, and we're finally past our, our current situation, we're gonna start doing seminars here at the store again and we're gonna be able to get together and get and dive deeper, you know, not only into this topic, but all the topics. We'll get to spend time together and, and get into more detail. So due to constraints of time, uh, you know, our, our American lawn story, and you know, lawns are really kind of an American anomaly, at least the way we use them here. They're kind of unique to this country. You don't see them used this way much in other places. And you know, the American lawn story really begins in the 17th century. But again, due to time constraints, I'm gonna fast forward to um, post-World War II America, you know, mid-century of the, of the last century. And you guys may remember a town called um, Levittown, New York. Abe Levitt um, built 17,000 homes. Um, and those homes in Levittown, New York, were the very first homes in the United States sold new with a pre-existing lawn. So the modern American lawn really began, you know, in the middle of the 20th century. And that was where, you know, that whole that whole that whole look started and you know it really you know the we had the gi bill from all the guys coming home from world war ii at the same time that made new houses kind of cheaper to buy than renting and you know everybody you know started buying up these um these track houses and you know the lawn really became kind of an extension of the pride of home ownership and you know it became as an american as apple pie you know maintaining your lawn and keeping your lawn nice you know really kind of conveyed a sense that you cared about your neighbors and that you cared about your community. And it was, you know, it was a way to show off. You know, unfortunately, you know, lawns really, they don't serve any purpose other than to make us feel and look good, um, which is okay. Um, but, you know, ecologically, environmentally, they don't bring anything to the table. And, you know, as is often the time during times of a war or conflict, you know, a lot of times, um, technologies and sciences are advanced and accelerated because you know things are needed for war so during the um vietnam era 
you know, that conflict was in a jungle environment. So there was a lot of research and development done in um, herbicides and in um, defoliants, you know, things to kill plants in the jungle. We all remember our Vietnam War history. So as is often the case, you know, companies, um, companies have really um, good times and good sales and revenues are pouring in when they're, when they're customers to the United States government. But often when these conflicts and wars end, their revenue stream dries up and they have to find a new, so, a new, a new place to sell their wares. So af, you know, after the Vietnam War, all these chemical companies had these herbicides that they, they lost their number one com- customer. So they really, they started focusing their attention on the American lawn. And I mean, I know there's plenty of you guys who are old enough as I am, who remember, I'm a child of the 70s, and I definitely have vivid memories of playing in my yard barefoot in the summer, or my grandparents' yard in the summer, or my friend across the street's yard in the summer, and stepping on honeybees barefoot, you know, playing in the yard and running through the sprinkler. And the reason for that is because our lawns had white clover in them and white clover was part of seed mixes so when you went to the garden center in the 60s in the 70s and bought grass seed there was a certain percentage of white clover in there and the reason for that is um clover is a legume it's in the pea family and they have a unique ability to remove nitrogen from the atmosphere and put it into the soil not all plants can do that it's a, some can but it's it's very famously unique to the pea family so they can take nitrogen from the air and put it in the soil so this has been known to science for, for centuries so the seed companies mixed white clover in with their grass seed because what it was doing was providing free nitrogen to your grass to your to your lawn um, so of course, after the Vietnam conflict ended and everybody was trying to get rid of their 2,4-D and um, nitrogen, um, which was used to make bombs and ammunition, um, they focused that attention on the American lawn and made a conscious effort, number one, to convince the American public that white clover was a weed. And white clover was the first weed targeted by these companies. Um, not going to mention any of them by name, but if you guys think, you probably come up with a few of them. Um, they decided to make white clover a weed. Um, the broadleaf weed killers came around, and also, you think about it, now you take the white clover away that's putting free nitrogen into your soil, so now you need to add nitrogen to your soil. So that, um, that, that's just a little bit of the the evil, the evil backstory on lawns and why they're hooked on certain products. Um, but what's really, um, what's really interesting is what it's done to the lawns. And the lawns were never an ecological wonder to begin with. But what's really, what's really ecologically and environmentally wrong about lawns is they're practically a desert. So in horticulture, it's what we would call a monoculture. It's where you have one thing growing in one space. And you have to think about the way nature works when it's untended. Like think of a forest, think of a jungle, you know, think of a meadow. You have, um, you have a cycle that occurs there. So you have trees that lose their leaves in the forest, in the jungle, they fall to the forest floor they break down, they turn back into soil, they add nutrients to the soil, you have birds in the tree canopies pooping and insects dying, and it all falls into that soil. And it breaks down into nutrients that plants can use, and the cycle just just continues over and over and over again. You guys have probably all seen stories of the of the guy who hasn't watered his terrarium since 1972 or has never taken the lid because there's just a little, there's just a circle going on in there and where things break down and it just, it just fertilizes each other. The problem with the lawn is it's, it's just a sterile environment. And the way we contribute even further to that, you know, we, we mow our lawns, but most people, when they mow their lawns, they have a, a bagging mower or they rake the, the, the grass clippings up. That, if that's left to break down on its own, it actually is free nitrogen for your soil. But that's, you know, we take that up for the sake of, you know, that manicured look, we, we remove that. And a lot of people think it actually causes thatch 
but it actually the opposite is true. It actually contributes to um, the prevention of thatch because it, it's, it breaks down and feeds that soil biology. So it's really just, um, it's really, there's, there's that. And then another huge issue is the amount of water that we have to put on our lawns. And one of the reasons we have to water our lawns so much here is all of the lawn grasses that we grow here in the United States were brought from Western Europe. And if you think about it, then I'm talking the Kentucky bluegrass, European, has, it has nothing to do with Kentucky. That came, that came from Western Europe. And Western, Western Europe's weather is much more moderate than it is here. It's not nearly as hot in the summer. It's not nearly as cold in the winter. And they have a lot more rain in the summertime than we do. So when our lawns turn brown here in the summer, it's not that the lawn is dead. That's a self-preservation method. That's the lawn going dormant because it's too hot and too dry for it. And it's not really meant for this environment. So, of course, we have to dump extra... Um, we have to dump extra water on top of the lawn, which just contributes to the problem. And there's just, you know, it just, it just, it, it's never, it's just a never ending cycle of ecological headaches. Um, so what I'm gonna do, cause we all have lawns, we're not gonna get rid of them anytime soon. So let, let me go through and talk about some different products, some that you may use, um, some that you may wanna consider using instead of what you're using. So stay tuned. All right, guys, so the, the main thing you can do to, ha to have less of a negative impact on the environment regarding your lawn and its care is obviously to have less of it. And I know that's not always practical for everybody, but, you know, do consider maybe planting more flower beds or more, or more vegetable gardens or taking up more space in your yard with, with, with plants other than lawn grasses. You know, that's one thing everyone can do. Um, but the other thing and the, the big thing is maybe making wiser choices regarding the products that you use. And most importantly, kind of kind of prioritizing and deciding just how important it is for you that your lawn look absolutely spotless at all times. I am very famously known for having a lawn that looks good from the street, that looks green from the street. It looks green from my porch, and I'm happy with that. It is probably 40% weeds, but it looks green from the street, and it looks green from my porch, so I'm okay with that. Um, but let's talk about some products here, many of which you probably use already. And I'm going to go through the good, the bad, and the ugly here, and hopefully give you guys some, if you're using some of the ugly ones, maybe give you guys a little inspiration to try some of the other ones. We sell all of these products here at the store. I'm not here today to bash any of them. Um, like I said, we do sell all of them, but a lot of these inorganic products and the chemical products, we are, we are definitely, as a company, moving in a direction where in a few years, we hope to not offer them anymore. So we wanna try and get as many people on board with the, with the organic stuff as we can. So I'm gonna start right off with the fertilizer because that's the one thing that most people tend to do with their lawn. And this is a conventional bag of chemical synthesized uh, lawn food right here. This product works very well and it works very quickly. You can often see your lawn go three shades of darker green within a day or two after you put this down and you water it in well. The problem with this is it is a chemical pellet. So it breaks down fairly quickly when you water it and it gets to the grass's roots pretty much instantly but it kind of it kind of it's kind of fleeting it kind of comes and it goes so it's it creates a series of like peaks and valleys when you fertilize with these uh, synthesized fertilizers if you're a person like me who drinks coffee you know think about caffeine you know you have your high and you have your low if you have kids and maybe they had a little too much sugar in one sitting you know you know about the peaks and valleys of that it's very similar to that sort of a thing. And just like the caffeine, your grass becomes kind of hooked on this. Because one of the things, I, like I was saying earlier, because there, we don't have leaves, we don't have grass clippings decomposing and going back into the soil of our, of our lawns, that, that, that environment is like devoid of organic material and your, your grass exhausts it all. So if you're not using this, if you don't have organic material and you're not using this, 
your your grass is gonna is gonna hurt from that so they become very very dependent on this so an alternative to this would be this uh, would be the espoma lawn food over here if any of you guys have ever used like holly tone or rose tone which sell a lot of that most people have used it before it has a very um you know it has a texture to it it's not pellets this is all this is derived from animal byproducts so this is dried manure this is bone meal this is feather meal so this is something that not only is going to feed your grass it's also going to feed the biology in the soil if it's there and it's also and this is the main difference this is actually going to add organic matter and it's going to improve the quality of your soil. It's going to help over time to improve the drainage and moisture retention. Whereas this is just, again, that's like that caffeine fix. It's going to, it's going to fertilize the grass real quick, but then it's going to, it's going to go, it's going to be fleeting. Um, the other really cool thing about this product, and I've talked about this before when we talked about, about the Holly Town, this um this product contains three different species of colony forming bacteria so this is bacteria that needs to exist in your soil to break down the organic matter to make things available to the grass um, different bacteria are responsible for different things some bacteria need to be there to make zinc available to the grass some bacteria have to exist to make boron available there's little relationships like our own digestive health you know like probiotics and things like that um there's little there's biological relationships going on in the soil between your grass's roots and the organic material they call it the poop loop the um the uh, bacteria have to break it down and they make the nutrients available to the grass it is not available directly to the grass without that bacteria unless you start dumping you know stuff like this on but again it's a quick fix um so definitely consider switching to an organic um an organic lawn food because again and this is i've said this before you know the environment you know the environment should be important to everyone but we are so close to long island sound here which is such an important but like sensitive body of water you know it you have to you, you know you have to think it through if you're dumping stuff on your lawn here in Darien or Norwalk or Stanford, there's a good chance that some of that's gonna end up in Long Island Sound over time. So it's just, we know how it works here. The runoff goes in the street, the runoff goes in the drain, the drain goes into Long Island Sound. So, you know, something to keep in mind when you're making your decision. So do consider moving to an organic lawn food from a chemical lawn food. Um, the nice thing with it too is you're gonna, this is gonna introduce some um, biology back into your soil. So over time, you will be using less of this. Um, a product that goes along with this right here is this Jonathan Green Love Your Soil. This is not a fertilizer. This is a food for the soil biology. So this actually contains humates and it actually contains horticultural molasses. So this is actually feeding the biology that's in your soil. Um, the amazing thing about this is if you have like soil that is compacted or soil that is like really hard that, you know, you can barely dig in, this after, over time is gonna help to fluff in and loosen up, loosen up the soil. So Love Your Soil is a great product to use in conjunction with the organic fertilizers because they work kind of hand in glove with each other soil biology in this bag biology food in this bag so consider switching over to um organic fertilizers another item that people typically use a lot not as often as they should but another one here is lime um the soil here in connecticut is typically acidic um so we usually have to add lime to our soil about once a year here, sometimes twice. Um, the soil in Connecticut is acidic because of, um, just because of the geographical part of the country we're in. Midwest is very alkaline, but the Northeast tends to be acidic. If the pH in your soil is not correct, if it's too high or too low, no matter how much fertilizer you have, um, the grass will not be able to use the nutrients. Um, the, the, the pH has to be correct in order for those nutrients to be available to the grass. It's chemistry. 
and your pH must be correct. So liming is important. Lime is organic. You don't have to worry about that. It's just crumbled limestone. Um, a good indication that you may need to use lime is if your lawn is full of weeds. And I'm not talking about just a couple of dandelions. If you have wild strawberry and ground ivy and plantains, all those weeds like, um, all those weeds like, an, uh, like a really um, acidic soil. So if you have, um, uh, if you see a lot of those, you probably need lime. That'll, that's a good first step to solve a weed problem is liming at least once a year. Um, another step here for weeds, and this isn't organic, there aren't a lot of organic choices for getting weed, rid of weeds in lawns. Um, but a good one that's been around for quite a few years now, this is just corn gluten. Um, this prevents weeds only. It will not get rid of weeds that are already existing in your lawn. A really cool product to get rid of existing weeds would be like this Weed Beater FE here. This is really cool. Um, the FE, if you guys remember your high school chemistry class, that's iron. And this is really just iron in this bottle. It's really kind of cool. Um, lawn grasses don't have a problem with elevated amounts of iron, but weeds do. So this Weed Beater FE is poisoning your weeds with iron. Again, an organic product. You know how even iron is not a good thing for humans to have too much of? You know, it kind of works the same for weeds. So you're poisoning your weeds with iron here with the Weed Beater FE. So that's a good one if you want to go organic and have, um, have weeds in your lawn. And then the last thing I want to talk about over here, and it was kind of my whole inspiration for the whole, um, the whole talk today, is we are getting upon our white grub season here in Connecticut. Um, August is August and early September is when white grubs really do most of their damage to our lawns. And we end up selling a lot of um, grub control, typically this one here. So I really wanted to talk about these two grub control products. Um, this is um, the Bio Advanced 24 Hour Grub Killer. It's called Dilox. This product works incredibly well. Um, it claims to kill grubs in 24 hours, and it does. Um, the issue with that is typically when a product works that well, it's really, really bad. Um, so this, this product here goes down dry, you water it in, it travels through the soil a couple of inches and then kills the grubs within 24 hours. I mean, think about how heavy duty that is. Um, it's not selective at all. You can probably see from the front of the package here, it also kills mole crickets, it kills ants, it kills ticks, it kills fleas, it kills webworms, chinch bugs. And I'm going to go out on a limb and assume it probably also kills earthworms and probably bumblebees and um, probably the soil biology as well. So this product is very useful. And if you have a grub control or a grub problem and that can be devastating to your lawn, I get it. Um, this is a good option for you to solve that problem. But in the future and where we really want to go with our grub control program here is we want to move to this product here, which is relatively new. This is um, the, the, grub, the grub gone here. And you guys, I've talked about the BT a couple of times this year, the Bacillus thuringiensis that we use for the budworms and the caterpillars. This is a derivative of that. So this item right here, this product, is only going to target white grubs. And I've said it many times, and I'll say it many times before again, um, the smart way to control pests is to know what kind of pest you have and then get a product that targets that pest specifically. If you have white grubs, there's really no reason you have to kill every living thing in your lawn, which is what this product is going to do. This is a bacillus, so this is a bacterium. It's going to get into the soil. It's going to prolificate there, and it's going to infect the grubs. It's going to make them sick. It's not going to poison them. That's the main difference. And it needs time to build up in the population. It needs to um, infect some grubs. And then as they interact with each other, it spreads from one grub to another. You know, this should sound familiar to all of us right about now. Um, but it, it's, you know, it's, you're basically creating a little uh, grub pandemic under, underground there. And it takes time to work. This is not a 24 hour thing. And this is something that you have to apply a couple times a year for a few years. But after you do, there's gonna be enough of it in the soil that you won't have to continue applying it. It's gonna build up a population in the soil and it's going to uh, prevent and preemptively 
keep those grubs, white grubs from coming back. So guys, I really, I hope I covered a bit here today on the subject of lawns. Like I said, not the most exciting topic in the world, but I really thought it would be helpful to kind of go over a couple of these products and kind of encourage everyone to really think about how important the lawn is to you before you make your decisions. And guys, as always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next week. Bow, 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 bow.